Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I've got a full house and joined by Jim Simonetti, Stevie Mullen, Kevin Graham, welcome to the show guys. Thanks for having us, thanks Thank very you. much Paul. It's brilliant, it's great to have four on the show, we've got loads to discuss. We're going out live on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. If you're on YouTube make sure that you do subscribe to us on there, it's all free of charge. We've got our daily bulletins, we've got a European encounter to look forward to on Wednesday night, we've got the Dundee United game to look back on, but I ask the question first and foremost, Andrew Dallas, incompetence or unconscious bias? Worst refereeing performance I've seen in some time. Stevie, what was your thoughts? I thought, well I wasn't surprised by him. He shouldn't have ever be a grade one official, fast-tracked obviously because his father's association and Saturday evening, <coughs> excuse me, he just gave everything. Nokia's broke up play. If you go with the yellow cards, two in the last ten minutes to try and kid on, he'd been efficient. The guy Conley should have been yellow carded in the first half, possibly sent off. Nothing, you know, so he really just isn't up to this level. Again, is he just hopeless or has he got an unconscious bias? Well, unconscious bias is something we like to discuss in a Celtic state of mind, obviously. <laughs> Mr Barnes had a good wee rant about that, Kevin, uh, a few weeks ago now. When I was watching it yesterday, uh, on Saturday, so, sorry, I was sitting next to Lawrence Conley, and Lawrence pointed out the issue with the free kicks and the fact that the Dundee United wall were never 10 yards away from the ball. It seems like a small issue, but it was constant throughout the game. When you consider the amount of set plays Celtic actually won at Tanadice. What Dallas was doing is great on Twitter. You can have a look and people edit this footage and, and you can actually start analysing it. He was taking nine steps, which you know would probably be the 10 yards. Steve and I were talking about this. Every ref should know how many of their own steps would be the 10 yards. And then he was taking a step back to do the line. So he was stealing a yard every single time. Now, is it incompetence or is there a bias? I'm not 100% sure. I, I think... You get told that these referees are reviewed to the inch of, within an inch of their lives, and he, every week, if you watch sports, you know you watch Celtic games, you see referees who just seem to make simple mistakes, and I don't, I don't know if it's a pressure thing. What you're talking about there with the free kicks is, I mean, he is definitely taking a step back. Mm -hmm. So. You have to ask yourself, why is he taking that step back? Is that Has he been trained wrongly? Has he been shown wrongly? Has he miscounted? Or, as you say, is he doing it deliberately? I would like to think that he wasn't doing it del deliberately because when you look at the standard of refereeing in Scotland, the standard of refereeing in Scotland is poor. And there seems to be quite a few referees that have been fast-tracked when they should never have been. Um, when you've still got Wally Collum as one of Scotland's top referees after the number of mistakes that he's made in high profile games then there's something seriously needs overhauled with the way referees are trained and promoted in Scotland See when I look at it Kevin we had a wee discussion before coming on air today we can't ignore issues like this you know people might say listen you won the game why don't you wind your neck in we can't ignore issues like this but that's when you bring it up. You bring it up when you win the game. Yeah. You point it out when you win games. Mm -hmm. You don't just point it out when it goes against you. Absolutely. What we're looking for is we're looking for our audience to get involved in this debate, if it is, is even a debate, to be honest with you. So please make your comments via Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Jim, you have watched football for a long, long time and there's been this ongoing issue of Celtic fans uh, in the belief that there is definitely um, a worse standard of refereeing when we come up against certain refs. Yeah. Is that something that you subscribe to yourself? Stevie used the word deficient. I would say about the referee for the weekend there, um, without getting ourselves uh, into any, any bother, is he was good, he was efficient, Stevie's used that word, efficient, he was excellent, all around about the park, and given free kicks where well, they don't matter, and given decisions uh, when they didn't matter. So the difference where he gives the free kick on the park, he gives the free kicks to Celtic where it, where it doesn't matter, and he's given them at a certain time when it doesn't matter. So what he's actually doing is, and that's how I'm saying he's, he's good, 
because his stats will show that he gave X to Dundee United and X to Celtic. But there's a difference when you're refereeing a game and you're watching that game. A referee such as uh, the referee on Saturday there can give uh, a decision easily, but it doesn't matter, to Celtic. And then he can give a decision to the opposition where it does matter. And this say that he's not been taught correctly and whatever. He knows what he's doing. He knows how many steps it should be. He knows he knows exactly every part of that game that what what he's doing throughout. Um he's no a Celtic he, he's no a Celtic lover. But what he should be is when he, he takes up that role as a referee, he should have uh his mindset and being professional and refereeing the game the way it should be refereed for both teams but we know that doesn't happen so I would say he was good at giving Celtic the, the free kicks and the decisions when and where they didn't matter See when you're looking at some of the flashpoints of the game you know the Frimpong incident where he's gone down in the box there was also a, an incident in the Dundee United box whereby we weren't sure if he had called a penalty or a free kick, Kevin, because we watch it without commentary so that we can obviously discuss the game and uh, bring up any points and, and engage with anyone watching our broadcast. At that point, you're thinking to yourself, Celtic score with seven minutes to go. If that incident happens in Celtic's box, I'm now of the, the view that Dundee United would get it in their favour. Am I being paranoid? I don't know, I don't think you're being paranoid, I think you, we've got historical evidence there to point out that these things some it do happen, especially to Celtic. I'm often wondering now, especially with the referees with a lack of cards, if the lack of the crowd is making a difference. Mm. And they can, they can get away with getting these fundamentals wrong. Not that, not that they should get away with getting the fundamentals wrong. The thing like the free kick, what you actually mentioned... His supervisor in the stand should be picking him up on that. He should be getting picked up on his poor performances and also given the, 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 the free kicks that he, that he gives. As Jim says, there's sometimes you'll see a tackle in the box and they'll wave play on because it doesn't matter if they can give it or not. It's easy to give the easy decisions, I think, when there's no crowd there. And I think that's what we're seeing maybe in a lot of the games. Um, that the fact that there's no pressure on the referees is maybe affecting them as well. What do you think, Stevie? Celtic uh, at home obviously have got the, the home advantage of a full stadium. When we go away, the, the crowd is very vocal. Um, does that make any difference, in your opinion, to the referees' decisions? I don't think it should. I watched the Champions League final last night. Daniel Orsato booked seven or eight different players. No crowd at that game. It's incompetence or unconscious bias by Dallas on Saturday. It's the only reason the crowd shouldn't affect him whatsoever. If he's going by the rules of the game, <coughs> excuse me, or the laws of the game, then he's got to do his job. I've often mentioned that it's easy to find out if a referee has had any association with a club in relation to season tickets, for example. I mean, the people that run the game can find out by checking season ticket sales over a period of time and if the person has had an allegiance to a club, then they shouldn't be refereeing that club's games. That's been mentioned in the past. The counter argument sometimes, Kevin, is you know they could be refereeing a game that would still affect the outcome of, of your own performance. Do you think there's anything that can be done to, to rid the doubt, the doubt that I've got in a, in a lot of the performances that I see as a football fan? Are we always going to have that doubt just because of the makeup of Scotland? Uh, are, we all, are we always going to have that where 50% of Scotland could be seen as anti-Celtic? So it doesn't matter where... That it, it's unlike England where if you're from Manchester you don't get to you don't get to referee a Liverpool or a Everton game because that that's clear there. Um, I, I, I do think that's maybe difficult in Scotland to try and place just because of the, the makeup of Scotland. And I'm not disagreeing, maybe I just don't want to go down the route that they're eh, biased. Mm -hmm. There is an uncon unconscious bias. I often think of, think of it, if I was standing on the line, being, being a linesman, and something happened that was a close call, how, how would I react? And to tell you the truth, I would react 
favouring my unconscious bias, favouring the team that I maybe grew up watching, eh? And maybe that's maybe it's a state of mind. Maybe that's got to get trained out of them. I don't think you would struggle to get a referee for Celtic games if you adhered to that policy. Mm. You know what I mean, Steve? It's easy to then say, right, not like a freedom of information request, but the authorities will be able to check a database of Motherwell season ticket holders over the last 20 years. No. The name, address and date of birth of every referee could be run against that. If you've had a Motherwell season ticket, you don't referee a game. Well, when we had the wee strike with them a couple of years ago, we didn't have any bother. The guys came in from England or wherever they came from mm-hmm. to referee our games. We don't seem to have the same problem when we play in Europe. What was the referee as well that got his last game at Ibrox because he asked for it? Bobby Tate. Bobby Tate. That's... Yeah, that's right. And I mean, see, when, when you're looking at unconscious bias, it's something that we've discussed a lot, sometimes tongue-in-cheek, but I know it's a serious issue uh, because of the, the discussion we had with John Barnes. It does exist. We've accepted that, Kevin. You've just said there, obviously, if you were a referee. And I remember reading a report in 442 when it was a good magazine about how no matter how professional a footballer is he's more likely to pass to somebody he likes in the team than somebody he doesn't get on with off the pitch so unconscious bias is something that you don't have the momentarily uh, the momentary uh, reason of thought to say that's a better pass it's happened because that, that's the nature of it so your decision making has happened prior to even the thought process. Well, let's have a look at it the other way. When I was talking about the lack of crowd, maybe we can have a look at it that the referee is more in control because there's not an emotional reaction from the crowd. So what Dallas done on Saturday was premeditated because he's not getting caught up in the occasion mm-hmm. because there isn't any occasion. Jim, would it concern you um, if it's tight going into the last few games of the season? In the league, and I'm not getting my excuses in early here. And I said that at the top of the show. This isn't me being a paranoid android. Would it concern you um, if you look at who's referee in our game? Forget about the end of the season. It concerns me just now. Let's park with this unconscious bias. Let's park with that right now. <laughs> there is a bias. There is a bias. People are out there that will want to stop Celtic from be progressing. Better it be for referees, linesmen, fourth officials, or whatever. Don't worry about unconscious business. It's, it is a, it's conscious at the moment. It doesn't. You don't need to deep into your unconsciousness to find that business. It's been there. It's been there for years. It's been there since Celtic Football Club was formed. Mm-hmm. So this is the biggest uh, year, one of the biggest years in our history. They are going to eat whatever it takes. We referees and um, and uh, whatever. Decisions they make on that park will be a instrumental in the result of that game. The guys are right to try and find somebody uh, that uh, it would be totally uh, unbiased towards a uh, Celtic in a game in Scotland could be very, very difficult. But again, I like a lot of referees. There's a lot of referees that we've dealt with at youth games, at junior games, Stephen, and, and whatever. And because uh, uh, who they're refereeing, they could take, uh, they, they could look at it and say, well, I'm not getting that decision here, I'm not getting that decision there. But I think Mr. Dallas, is, uh, on Saturday, he showed exactly uh, what he was going to give Celtic. And he gave them nothing. And I don't know how the stats have come out, how many to Dundee United, how many to Celtic. But it doesn't matter what he gave to Celtic. They weren't. The decisions weren't at the right time or in the right position of the park. Referees like him are clever where they're given the decisions on the park and which part of the park it is. So, referees, Celtic, I'm going to go back to Mr Steen. You're not playing 11. Today you could be playing 12, 13 or 14 depending who those officials are. In Scotland, if that is still the same, and this is us not putting pressure on anybody uh, out there, this is factual. This is factual. Celtic have got to go out and make it happen for themselves. Don't get frustrated with the refereeing decisions. And we worked right to the end uh, on Saturday to the seven, seventh uh, uh, minute, kind of the last seventh minute, or whatever it was there. Hey, Paul, you'll be able to correct me on that. It was seven, seven minutes from the end, Aye. Jim. So yeah. they worked away, they worked away. 
they worked away and we got the result that mattered. So now we can analyse the game, analyse the referee, because he's part of the game. No matter what, he's a big, big part of the game. But uh, I'm with Stevie uh, to find a referee that's uh, unbiased could be very, very difficult. Well, a lot of the comments coming in agree with you, Jim, and I think it's based on the point that you're you're saying it's not unconscious bias, it's just bias. And I've got messages coming in from Facebook um, and also via Twitter. Martin Scullion, thank you for getting involved, who are saying, well said. Jim, let's go back to some more of the comments there that are coming in. And we've got uh, a comment from Cairns Celtic on Twitter who reckons it's a level of referees in the league. So he thinks that the competence is an issue uh, across the board. Declan McConville, a long-time contributor to a Celtic State of Mind, an important part of the team, is commenting on YouTube. Absolutely shameful refereeing at times. Some of the tackles from Conley were horrific. And he got away with it constantly. And um, I think... That is really the, the view and the belief of many people who are getting involved in, in making comments. Uh, DRAF via YouTube, was he doing the same one step back for the United free kicks? Well, that would be interesting because Billy Beard, um, he follows that up by saying nine steps is never ten yards unless you've got the stride of a giraffe. <laughs> it's normally horses we deal in, but giraffe, that's fine. Measure your own step size and you'll see what I mean. That makes it even worse then. It makes it even worse if, if you know, because he's taken nine, he's taken one back, and then he's taken an even a further distance to to mark the line. Lawrence Conley, as I said, he pointed it out on the day, and it was only when I looked back on it, Kevin, at night time, I thought you, you were spot on there, Lawrence. I was caught up in the action, I must admit, but it was very one sided in terms of the decisions, is what I'm saying. What can a club like Celtic do in a scenario if we honestly believe, as Jim has suggested, and as most of the people commenting agree? that they're biased against Celtic. What can you do? It's up to the club to highlight it, and Stevie rightly says we highlighted it before, and strangely enough, it was a game at Tannadice that caused the referee's strike. That's right. Um, so we highlighted it before, and the referees went on strike, and we got in the foreign referees, and the, the guy who refereed the Celtic game was for Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. I, I remember him. He never left the centre circle. He, he was he was fantastic. He never got involved. He, he, you, you look at certain referees who get in the way of the ball, get in the way of the play. Um, what can Celtic do? Celtic can highlight it, bring it to their attention, and behind closed doors, which they say that they do. Um, they can do it in the press press conferences, especially the treatment that uh, the, the Dundee United centre half was given out. How many tackles did he get away with? That were bookings, mm -hmm. uh, the big the big guy Connolly. But then the way I look at it, he had Bruni shouting in his face when we actually scored. So that that was a bit of karma for that. But Celtic have got to highlight it uh, as publicly as possible. The first tackle, Paul, the big guy Connolly done in Eddie to use a Glasgow term, it was an absolute Snyder mm. right down the back of his uh -huh. Achilles. Mm -hmm. That 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 could have put him out for months. No warning, no anything. Then the second one, usually any other referee worth a salt, would just show an automatic yellow card. That's when he got his first warning. Dallas was very, very poor on Saturday. It was. It was dreadful. And some of the comments, in fact, all of the comments that are coming completely agree with us. We'll return to them. There's a few other points to cover as well. We won the game. It was a hard-fought victory. I think over the season, Dundee United have enough to do OK this season, is from what I've seen. And that was without one of their star men and Lawrence Shankland. Um, so when I was watching it, obviously the goalkeeper had a, a cracking game as well. But leading up to that goal, you mentioned Brown shouting in Connolly's face. Did anybody see the footage where you could hear <laughs> Bruni giving Eddie a few words of advice? Yes. Brilliant, eh? Brilliant. Brilliant, <laughs> love it. But how instrumental was Scott Brown in the lead up prior to the main shot that the goalkeeper spilled? He was brilliant. Did you see it? He took the ball deep in, was it from Beaton? He moved 60 yards. He, he was the orchestrator of the initial move, wasn't he? It's unseen mm. where, where a lot of people would, would, for me, with that goal for the first time that, that I saw it, and on replay, you look at the Aieti, the fact that he's, he's had the, the speed of mind to win the header back, then the speed of mind to pick up the loose ball. You, you never notice Brown. You, you, you've noticed Brown laying the ball back to Christie for mm -hmm. the initial shot, but you haven't seen where Brown's come from because... 
your mind doesn't go that far back because you're also you're always concentrating on that moment yeah. there. But when you have a look at it, it was his movement, and it's simple movement. It's just moving into space. But when people say, what does Scott Brown bring to Celtic? Nobody would say, or when, nobody would say he created that chance. I know. They would say that he breaks up the game, that he's a great leader. But he was in the box. He wanted Eddie to pass the ball, ball to him for him to shoot. Is that what he said? I think, see when you look at it And Alan Morrison uh, makes the exact same point Kevin, you look at assists, that's now a thing In football, back in the day you never really said Well, Paul McStay assists I'd love to see the fact, uh, oh, facts no. and stats But uh, he starts talking about secondary assists Because I mean, Scott Brown is not Part of the goal if you look at the stats But if you go back 30 seconds If it wasn't for Brown's involvement We were coming away 0-0 After that game We've spoken about Brown, we've spoken about his legs um, going through the season. I think Saturday was a great example of just how important he is, Stevie, as a player, not just as a captain, because we had that debate as well. Someone pitched Paul McStay or Scott Brown. Everybody universally said McStay. My point was, as a captain, actually Scott Brown's a better captain. So is he going to be playing every week or is he is he going to be uh, saved? In games like um, midweek, take him off with half an hour to go. I think Paul uh, Scott Brown has adapted his game. I think what you're talking about there leading up to goal is traditional Scott Brown play. Mm-hmm. I don't think Scott Brown is a traditional holding midfielder. I think it was foisted on him when he left the, when Yama and these guys left. Because if you take a traditional and we go what's actually called a Makalele position, Scott Brown has never been that type of player. He was only one that the midfield who was left who could even sort of make a half a hard tackle. Scott Brown's not a hard tackler. He got that position. What he'd done to contribute to the goal was the Scott Brown mm. that we seen at Hibernian. Yeah. You know, all eight years ago. So Scott Brown is now this holding midfielder, which I don't think is his best position. So we could even still adapt Scott and put somebody else in there to use his energy and drive. You talk about box-to-box players and that move in itself was a classic box-to-box move by Scott Brown. Picks the ball up, as you say, moved quite easily, Kevin, into that space between the two Dundee United strikers and, and that was the, 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 the start of that move. Jim, when you're looking at uh, a player like Brown, you know, he's playing 50, 60 games a season. He's now 36. Are you of the view that he should still be the first name on the team sheet? Well, you always look. Your captain should always be your your first uh, name in the team sheet. But um, where we've got to just now is that uh, a language TV saying as well that that position was actually forced upon him. That uh, I, I liked Scott Brown when he was going going more forward, but now all these years have passed. He's he settled into that that role. Uh, we we use him wisely. Maybe he has lost that wee, wee, wee yard of pace uh, and whatever, but I thought he was quite clever and good and he's adapted his game on sa- Saturday there. Um, I would use Scott Brown wisely as as we're going. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how that is, we'd be doing to Neil Lennon and how he puts it in. He, maybe it's time now to have a wee look even more around about a McGregor, a Cham, and Christy, but then again, Christy, eh, maybe they're, they're all too, maybe a wee bit similar in there. But I think Scott Brown, I, I think we had this discussion last week as well, Stephen, that eh, why would we automatically leave Scott Brown out? We've got a choice there to have players run about him. So he could still be very important with other players maybe dropping out as well and, and leaving him in there for certain parts or a period of time in the game. I thought looking at it on Saturday, and again you can only see for the TV, aye. I thought we lined up a wee bit differently Saturday. Aye, it looked aye. as if it was a 4-4-1-1. Aye, I think aye, with you're with, right, no, you're right, Eddie Stephen, sort of just playing off of, or sorry, and Cham playing off of Eddie. Aye, aye, and I, I've actually, I know we're not going on to that yet, but I've actually got that similar to, to yourself here, because at times I felt as well, Edward, Edward had about three or four players run about him. Yeah. And if he... If he'd have been up a wee, even up higher at the beginning, Stephen, he might have been able to take players away with him and give Eddie a wee bit of a, a space. But it's funny you should say that. I'm I'm kind of doing the same line as you here on that on that setup. I thought it was too ponderous, Jim, to to, to get the benefit of that inside. I, I thought the the build up was so laboured, was incredible. It was. See when I when I saw the team lines, 
I thought the team selection felt forced to try and get in charm into the team. It didn't have a balance for me. When I had a look at it, I was like, that's, this feels like they're trying to stick. There's a, there's a round peg on the this. Uh, they've been watching the bulletin, get in charm in the team. How do you think he performed, Kevin? I thought he'd done well, yeah. but I don't think it was his best game. I don't think he was in his best position, and I and I, and I do think that when he, when you look at the team from the night from the Wednesday night before to the uh, different circumstances, understand. I agree completely with Stevie. The team was quite laboured, mm. and I do think that was maybe to do with Ryan Christie not being in his best position and Cham taking up the Christie role. What is his best position then, Christie? Because there is a debate around whether or not we play him on the left. El Yunusi, I thought was poor. On Saturday, Christy obviously plays in that number ten role at times. What's his best position? He's our most consistent creative player, so he should be playing the number ten. Right, and if he's playing ten, where do you play Encham? And this is go back to your point and, and Stevie's point. Mm-hmm. You're forcing Encham in. Where do you play Encham, or does he not start? For me, he doesn't start at the moment. Right, I just you know I've gone on about El Yunusi. Everybody knows I'm a big fan of El Yunusi. I was delighted when he came back in. Uh, and I thought he had a good game during the week. But again, he was poor at the weekend. What do you do with him? Do you rest him? See, for me, I think um, Mo is going to enjoy the wide open spaces of Celtic Park. Mm-hmm. And some of the away games are not going to suit him. And some of the away games, we might need to actually put an extra body in the middle of the park and only get the wood from the fullbacks. And maybe s- Saturday night was one of those games, especially with Dundee United running themselves into the ground. Uh, Mo could be a fantastic sub to bring on after a team tires after 70, 75 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, someone has commented on Facebook to advise us that Brown got a yellow card for what you were suggesting. Are we a wee word in Conley's ear after the goal. Swearing at Eddie. Yeah, I mean, people are also yeah. suggesting that uh, Turnbull, Regan Stevenson, thanks for getting involved, Regan, um, a replacement for Encham. I wouldn't get rid of Encham. I'd keep no. him. I think he's got enough quality that we can utilise him during the season. I, I'm, I'm torn with Encham. I can't see a, a spot in the team for him at this precise moment in time without a change of system. But I don't want to lose him because he's such a fantastic player. It, Turnbull... As well, we're talking about Scott Brown. It reminds me a bit of the Hib Scott Brown that we've never seen at Celtic. Because when he, when Scott Brown came in, Gordon Stratton started playing him as a deep line midfielder, tried to change his game. When you, when you look at Turnbull, he's got a positive energy, he tries to make things happen, mm-hmm. he tries to drive forward. And that could be a great... A, great addition to the squad as well. It's something different. I, I see a bit of a young Brown in Turn- Turnbull and I don't see any other of our midfield options having what a Turnbull's actually got. If we look ahead to the European game, Stevie, uh, during the week, looking forward to it, do we change, again, do we change our formation for that? I mean, Kevin's already mentioned the, the width of Celtic Park and we saw us, you know, cutting open Hamilton. We've done the same against Reykjavik. Is that the way to go? I think you need to change it directly. Frimpong needs to come out of the team for, the, for going to the Champions League games. El Mohamed has to come back in without a shadow of a doubt. Oh, I agree with that. Mm-hmm. The thing for the left back, which really surprised me Saturday because I quite like Greg Taylor, is, and he was putting in his 5Ks when they were all in, off. He was consistently the fastest. So mm. I think that boy's got a pace that he can run forever. But on Saturday, I was alarmed at his lack of pace. You know, he's not got a trick. So if he doesn't cross the ball first time, we're not getting any crosses from him. Yeah. So that, that was really alarming. I think James Forrest has got to go back in. Played well, didn't he? I thought he contributed great, you know, and then he starts skiing them something else to worry about, you know. Mm. See, I, I think James Forrest is an easy, easy target for a lot of Celtic fans, but his contribution to the club's fantastic. It's so really I would have him back in. I had a, but he, again, hey Stevie, there's something wrong here because me and you are kind of a, agreeing on a few things. Today. <laughs> because you're sitting across I, the table. I, 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 don't, I don't know why, but we're, we're kind of agreeing that. And That's why we brought Kevin. I, I, well, he, he'll get it later on as we go here, don't worry. But uh, I, 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 I think Greg Taylor he, and the, is showing great, but he, he looked like an average he player to me in Saturday. I don't know why. He, he, his performance that I've seen in the past has been brilliant, but it seems that there was just something on Saturday where it's been. He's been instructed eh, not to take the one on one on one going down that channel. Uh, I, I don't know. Eh, I don't think 
he's as fast as Frimpong what I've seen at the weekend. But again, Frimpong's going to come out for me. And I think it was run about when I counted it, roughly he had about six a, a, a attempts to deliver into the box. And the quality wasn't the best that maybe we, what we've seen. Mm. So I don't know if it's just a one-half thing, Stephen, or whatever. But I think uh, I'm disappointed in, in, in Greg Taylor at, at the weekend. Not disappointed as such, but the performance was uh, was done for what I was expecting. Tin hat time for me then because you were talking about the distribution of a fullback and uh, if you look at the stats, Maurice Boyer's distribution was excellent last season every time he played. Yet Celtic fans didn't rate him and he got sent away back down south. He could play right back, left back. For me, he was a solid enough defender but I think the, the comments will start coming in before I finish this sentence because he was not um, really rated, was he? I, I think the problem on Saturday when I thought we became ponderous came from near Beaton. Mm. You can dominate the game and be the most influential player playing in that position. But instead of what he was doing in the Wednesday night game against Reykjavik, which was passing the first time, he was taking five or six touches yeah. at the weekend before he was making his pass or making his forward run. But that time, everybody in Dundee United is back into position. He, not solely, but was greatly really responsible for how slowly we played at the weekend. I'd like to see Elhamad coming in, like you say, right. playing alongside Ayer and Julian. But they've got to move that ball sharper, they've got to move it faster, mm-hmm. because we can't, we can't give teams the opportunity to go back. If we've caught them for a lot of part, we cannot give them the opportunity to get back to, and get a, the, the team shaped back in. It's got to be bang, bang, bang. There it goes, and we're hitting them where it hurts and hitting them fast. We, we must stay there. These three, four, five extra touches, whatever they're taking... Can it, they must be sharper. They agree, must be sharper. I agree with Stevie there. I think Beaton slows the game down. Yeah. And uh, Julian and Ayer do try to play the ball quicker from the back. Ayer's got that habit as well, Kevin, of galloping 40, 50 yards at a time. But sometimes we And need making, that. You, yeah, making you up that room. And sometimes, as you say, against Dundee United, it's nothing each. Sometimes, like what Brown did, although he used the passing movements, Ayer makes that that kind of distance up just by going on one of these mad gallops but we saw it last season against Aberdeen yeah. when they moved them to left back mm-hmm. talking of left backs there's there's been some suggestion that Ryan Sessegnon might be coming in on loan that's a player who obviously is at Spurs at the moment he hasn't played much for Tottenham uh, but I think we're all in agreement left back is still a position Jim you've just mentioned Greg Taylor right. there. it's still a position we need to strengthen in isn't it I, I, is a, I mean if Josie can do uh, Big oh, money move, Jim. Big That's money move to fill him. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking, is he, is he seen about 25 million, that guy or whatever? Yeah, big, big money move. Was, just last was. season to fill him. Aye. So, I mean, uh, well, that's, that's a new one in me, Paul. I, I didn't know that. But I, I'm just thinking, um, uh, that is a big move. That's quite adventurous as well. If, if we're looking at bringing him in, guys, and Jose Marino lets him come up. Well done, excellent. But again, Jim, it's one of these things, great attacking option. Aye. Defensively, couldn't keep Wayne's that close. No. <laughs> you know, so we've got to get somebody in there who's going to make it solid. Aye. You know, and I don't think there's any fullback at the club on the left-hand side who's going to give you that strength. I think we need to go and get somebody who's going to give you defensive cover. As I say, go back to John Collins made Tosh McKinley an internationalist. Aye. We don't have a left-sided midfield player mm-hmm. who's going to give you real strength, especially if you've got a, a more fragile left-back. Mm. So what you're saying is, Stevie, for, first and foremost, uh, he's there to defend. For, that's his job, first of all, is to, is to defend and, and then to attack. But Because uh, I think to go with what the boy says, <sighs> Kevin and Paul there, if Christopher Ayer is going to make the runs out, and sometimes if he does that, it's absolutely fantastic because yeah. it'll pull guys out of position for the opposition. Aye. If you've got a fullback who can't defend, you're very, very weak and vulnerable, vulnerable on the left hand side of your defence. Absolutely. Absolutely. But if you've got the guy who thinks first and foremost as the strikers were saying here, then it lets the other two go and then he's organising there as well. No, I'm I'm agreeing with you, Stephen. I'm agreeing. And by the way, that's that's one of your best quotes yet. The stolen motor one was good. <laughs> uh, the trap in the beach ball in the, the phone, phone box is good. And now try to stop the Waynes for getting up the claws. <laughs> so that's up there with the blue hats on horses. You know what I mean? So well done. introduced the giraffes today as uh, well. Giraffes. I, I do think we're a bit harsh on Greg Taylor. I think there's a there's a lovable honesty about him. 
And no, we're going with no, we're going with. Sorry for jumping in. No, we're going with the weekend there, uh, uh, Kevin. Honestly, he looked a very, very average player at the weekend. Uh, everybody's allowed a poor game. Jim. Oh, no, this year. You're going, to be disa- you're going to be disappointed I, I, I very often. Be. Nobody's, no, listen, uh, sorry, nobody's allowed a, a bad game. Everybody's going to keep working at their game and trying be trying that that be a bit better. Sorry to jump in on top. Of you I didn't mean to no, apologise, no, no, but fine. but far as I'm concerned, you're paid that money. You're playing for Glasgow Celtic. You've got to be on top of your game every week, every week, and players don't have the best games. But we have got to have the best games that we can. The, the problem with that is uh, we don't actually have anybody. If Taylor does have a runny poor form Aye. to step in, going back to your point, Stevie, with the left midfielder, again a player I've championed all season, El Yunusi. He's not doing it at the moment. I'm not writing him off, but we've seen Jamesy Forrest playing on the left there on Saturday, and he looked better than he had done in the, in the previous week. Do we move him over? Do we give El Yunusi a rest? Can we push Frim Pong up to the right? Because he's an, an offensive player, Frim Pong, isn't he? Is that something that you would consider? I, I, I wouldn't have Frim Pong on the team. I, I, I thought on Saturday, I say, I, I agree with Kevin. I, I don't think Greg Taylor's a bad player. I just think he's no got great pace. And if we're going mm-hmm. to push up, on the right hand side of the park the other day, the wee boy Frim Pong never put one cross by the first man. Mm-hmm. No. If we've questioned his defensive capabilities, that we don't think he's the best right back, then he's obviously not the best right winger. So d- how do you then fit him into the team? You know, you've, he's still a wee boy, you know, and I don't think he's got any great presence on the park. I know he gets kicked and he falls, but I, I wouldn't have him in the team. Frimpong. It's, it's a shame when you see the impact he made initially, Stevie. And I think his game's changed, doesn't it? That initial burst that we saw for half a dozen games, he was leaving people um, you know, lying on the floor half the time. We don't see that as often now, do we? No. I think it's maybe he's just it's the adrenaline's wore off. Mm-hmm. The innocence people have maybe is sussed him out a wee bit as well. Maybe the double up on him now. But he, he he was quoted as saying that when he played in Holland he was a right winger and they moved them back. Because his shooting wasn't good enough. So is there maybe a bit of work there for the Celtic backroom staff? I think he would be better moved up with El Hamed behind him. I love El Hamed. He defends and attacks with a directness. And there's a simpleness in his game which is very difficult to do. Uh, so for me El Hamed's got to be the right back. But we can't just dis- dis- disregard the talent that Fung Pong's got. We just need to find out what his best position is. Mm-hmm. Fair I, point. I think El Hamid brings a maturity to the yeah. team. Mm-hmm. A, a calmness. You know, he, he's a man. Mm-hmm. Frimpong's still a boy. You know, if he's going to be playing and we have to mature him and bring him on, he's not ready to replace James Forrest yet. No, no, no he's not. You know, so if he's can he be the right back and he can he be the wide right guy, where do we try and fit him in? This is the thing we're trying to fit in, Chairman. And you then know, you're looking at I, don't, it, I yeah. don't think we should be fitting anybody in. Mm-hmm. I think if you're a right back, you play right back. If you're a right sided midfielder, you play that. See, we'll get a position for him. It doesn't work. Invariably, it doesn't work. This is where I thought the team on the team selection looked forced on Saturday because there was too many guys had been moved about to mm. to accommodate the players that we wanted to play. I looked unbalanced, Kevin. I looked unbalanced. Right. You, you bang one for Saturday. Didn't look a good balance to the side. No, he's right. We dominated the game, though. We deserved to win the game, but the team did look unbalanced. And I wonder if that was. I wonder if that lended its hand to the ponderous nature of our build up at times. I've always felt that about Beaton. Though sometimes when you're playing the, the kind of fast attacking moves as well, it comes to Beaton in midfield and everything just slows down, Kevin. I've always felt that about him. Gary Doonan, uh, welcome back to the show, Gary. You're commenting via Facebook. And he makes the point that El Hamid is an identical to Lustig, the leadership qualities. I, I think he's a great player. It's unfortunate that he's been injured so much, Stevie. But um, he was saying this morning that um, Lennon picks him for the big game, so he should be playing during the week. I'd love to see that. Do we change our formation 3 5 2? Would you start with a, a jetty? I, w- I wouldn't. Have- Changed to a three five two unless we were to bring in another central defender before that, and I think the Champions League deadlines tonight for bringing anybody in. Mm-hmm. Then you've got a decision. If no, then I think it's four four two mm-hmm. or four four one one, whatever formation he goes. But I would just have a back four for Wednesday night unless he brings another central defender. And is Shane Duffy on his way up to Glasgow? 
Well, hopefully that plane's got Glasgow on the deadline on a destination. It would be good. It would be good. If this happens whilst we're on air, please let us know if Shane Duffy signs. We're looking out for a centre I'm, half. I'm getting bored of the whole Shane Duffy thing. It's like getting locked in a cupboard waiting on somebody to get like you. Just Is get it, it our way either way. Is he signing or no? Just That's another story. Kevin, <laughs> oh, I would have liked to be locked in a cupboard with you. You know what I mean? You, you might have your, you might have your, your jockeys out filming in there with your wee whip and all that because you like the horses, you know? <laughs> Let's have a wee look ahead to the European game then. I mean, we had a very good insight provided to us by Kevin McCluskey. Kevin um, is a boy that is a native of Stirling, I think, Kevin, and he's moved over to Budapest. He's got a great knowledge of the Hungarian game. And he says, you know, they'll be more worried than we'll be of them. However, we need to treat it with respect, as I think we would anyway. Um, however, he, he gave us a good insight into the, the Hungarians. It's going to be a, a harder game than it was last week, isn't it? Definitely, and the two names, Celtic Fenavaros, it's got a ring of a great European tie, eh? mm-hmm. an old school European tie, mm-hmm. a one off game. Um, the, the, the way that I look at it, we'll have to be positive. We've got we've, where we want to be, we've got to beat the champions of Hungary. And uh, for me, I think we will do that. They're, they're, I don't think there's anything to be scared of, but because it's a one off game, anything can happen. We've got to turn up. We've got to be on the top of our game. But I'm looking forward to uh, uh, us turning up on the night. I'm looking forward to us uh, playing really well. So. We're just getting a, a question in about your cupboard, so I'll a ask cupboard. you. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> who, locked, who locked Kevin a cupboard and why? <laughs> if it was me it was cho- choosing the team, I don't know if Neil Lennon will do it. I would swap. Eddie in a jetty's position for Wednesday night's game. Right. I would have Eddie's a 10 in a jetty up front. That's a discussion to have with Gordon Strachan, isn't it? And John Hartson. No, Gordon Strachan, no, no. You Do you not like Gordon Strachan? You know why I don't like him? And it's uh. going to go back to, you might not remember this, it was a cup final when he tried his damnedest to get Roy Aitken sent off. Uh, I've never forgiven him. And the Selig you know, Supporters Association you know. refused to play his testimonial because of that. That's right. Anyway, I'm the same... I'd actually have the same two up front as yourself. But I would change them. I would change them a bit. Sort of playing the ten. Aye. So Aye. we could get away from the confines of four and five defenders. Or it's true what Stratton did say though. Eddie can drop deep, and he's maybe better coming from deep. You know, I don't know. I don't know. It meant that well, uh, Gordon Stratton's. Uh, he, he knows what he's uh, what he's seeing and what he's talking about, and. Um, I like Gordon Strachan, but has he got it in him eh, to to be that first striker and work and work? I don't know. I don't know. I think he finds pockets of space, Jim. He finds pockets of space, but he's got to work as well as a first striker. He's got to work and to get in the shimmy for that ball and create. He's got to create as well for the second striker to give the ball in. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it's good, but I've got him as a first striker to see how it works. We've got a couple of minutes left of the bulletin, so please keep your, your points coming in. Stevie, you are wanting to speak yourself about uh, the stories and the songs. I, I would love to know your viewers' thoughts on this. I read a great article the other day that's about the debate around rebel songs at Celtic Park. Mm-hmm. A former Republican prisoner, a Celtic fan, Paddy McMenamin, he's a Celtic fan from Belfast, an IRA prisoner, six years in long, cre- long case, so no stranger to Ari- Irish rebel music or songs that have been sung on terraces and stands at Celtic Park throughout the years. What's the fans' views on it now? Mm-hmm. Do they think they should be sung? Do they think they should be curtailed? Do you think you should be singing the songs against colonialism? Or should you be glorifying songs that have probably been sung by my forefathers? And without being a hypocrite, I've certainly sang most of those songs during my younger life that I wouldn't sing at Celtic Park now. Even going back to Jim Kerr from Simple Mind saying when he was talking about buying Celtic that he wanted to be able to sing the terrace and, and sing the songs that his father sung. Mm. So it would be great to get that debate and know what the fans thought on it. I think that's a, a whole show in itself. Yep. And it's mm. probably one that will, will open that debate up tomorrow. I think it's a great point. It's one of these things that people, like you say, Stevie, you look back to your youth, even myself, and 
you know, hearing these songs first and foremost on a supporters bus like yourself, Kevin, mm-hmm. going through to the games and then wondering about the history and what, what the songs were and who these figures were who were being referenced in the songs. And then you would learn about the history. You'd learn about Irish history, you'd learn about Celtic history, the intrinsic link between the two. Um, so I always felt that it was a, almost an education uh, going to a Celtic game and the travel travelling through on the bus. It's obviously been outlawed in, in recent times. And there was even a confusion, Stevie, uh, between which songs should be allowed and which ones shouldn't. And that all came down to knowledge, really, of the um, the people who were trying to cl- uh, stamp them out. So I think it's a great debate, but we need to focus on it for an entire show. And um, it'd be great if you could be part of that show as well so maybe not as early as tomorrow but we'll certainly get it in the diary and See, I just think it it's there. quite derogatory when you hear some of the, the younger fans making this thing about Celtic dads we're, we're of an age but we grew up in the 80s when Thatcher was at a prime the minor strike the hunger mm-hmm. strikes the mm-hmm. decimation of Fleet Street taking school milk off of school children we stood up to all that as political activists you know so when you get ah, Celtic dads I think it's a totally derogatory thing but it would be interesting now to see if any of these people with all these terminologies, what they would actually do for it. Yeah, I think we opened that up to the, the wider fan base. Good discussion. A brilliant discussion. We are going out now to a quarter of a million across all our platforms a month. So we're going to open it up to the Celtic fan base. What do you think? And uh, we'll have a, a debate about that on the bulletin, Stephen. Hopefully you can attend. Um, so have a think about that. Uh, you already probably have your view and we can discuss it on a future edition. Now, I've got to say today was fantastic. We could probably, this could probably be the first half we could go again. But thank you to Jim Simonetti and also to Stevie Mullen and to Kevin Graham. And thanks for everybody for tuning in to a Celtic State of Mind. Thank you. Cheers. 